Now open your question paper and look at part one. You'll hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions one to eight, choose the best answer A, B, or C. One. You overhear a woman recommending a campsite. Well, there are two campsites about five kilometers apart, but I'd go to the Morvich site if I were you. Unless you want to be near the castle and the museum, which are a fair distance from it, even if you're driving. All we wanted was to be able to go for walks and enjoy the stunning views of the lake. You definitely wouldn't get that at the other site, though. I've heard that the showers are better than at Morvich, and it's also got a little shop which you may find useful. We don't bother about things like that, so we'll definitely go back to Morvich next summer. Now play the recording again. Well, there are two campsites about five kilometers apart, but I'd go to the Morvich site if I were you, unless you want to be near the castle and the museum, which are a fair distance from it, even if you're driving. All we wanted was to be able to go for walks and enjoy the stunning views of the lake. You definitely wouldn't get that at the other site. Though I've heard that the showers are better than at Morvich, and it's also got a little shop which you may find useful. We don't bother about things like that, so we'll definitely go back to Morvich next summer. Two, you overhear two friends talking about global warming. I've just got back from the Alps. Lots of the mountain passes that are normally full of snow at this time of year are still green. If this is the result of global warming, it's very worrying. There are certainly strange things happening to the weather, but there's nothing to worry about really. My sister spent two weeks in Cape Town last year, where she'd hoped to find big waves and plenty of winter surf, and she was shocked to find nothing. I went two weeks ago. And it was a completely different story. I can't believe that you're saying that. There's no hope for our planet unless something's done soon. Now play the recording again. I've just got back from the Alps. Lots of the mountain passes that are normally full of snow at this time of year are still green. If this is the result of global warming, it's very worrying. There are certainly strange things happening to the weather, but there's nothing to worry about really. My sister spent two weeks in Cape Town last year, where she'd hoped to find big waves and plenty of winter surf, and she was shocked to find nothing. I went two weeks ago, and it was a completely different story. I can't believe that you're saying that. There's no hope for our planet unless something's done soon. Three, you overhear a young couple talking about moving to the country. You've got this idea that moving to the country is going to change your life dramatically, but it needn't be like that at all. I know you can't bear the thought of giving up simple things like going to the library or the gym, but think of all. You the... don't understand how important all that is for me. Well, the main thing is your job wouldn't be affected. You'd be able to carry on writing your articles anywhere, wouldn't you? From the point of view of work, it might not be a bad thing. There'd be no interruptions from well-meaning friends dropping in for a chat any time of day. Now play the recording again. You've got this idea that moving to the country is going to change your life dramatically, but it needn't be like that at all. I know you can't bear the thought of giving up simple things like going to the library or the gym, but think of all. You the... don't understand how important all that is for me. Well, the main thing is your job wouldn't be affected. You'd be able to carry on writing your articles anywhere, wouldn't you? From the point of view of work, it might not be a bad thing. There'd be no interruptions from well-meaning friends dropping in for a chat any time of day. Four. 
You hear a part of a radio program about food. This afternoon, I'll be joined by Phil Harkins, the chef whose cookery books and television appearances have made him a celebrity. But this time, instead of talking about his award-winning books or his TV cookery courses, he'll be helping you. You may have learnt how to cook at home or at school, or maybe you went to a cookery school. But are you still unsure about a few things? Phil will try to clarify any doubts you may still have. So whether it's how to cook the perfect boiled egg or how to organise a five-course meal, now's your chance. Call us from three o'clock. Now play the recording again. This afternoon, I'll be joined by Phil Harkins, the chef whose cookery books and television appearances have made him a celebrity. But this time, instead of talking about his award-winning books or his TV cookery courses, he'll be helping you. You may have learnt how to cook at home or at school, or maybe you went to a cookery school. But are you still unsure about a few things? Phil will try to clarify any doubts you may still have. So whether it's how to cook the perfect boiled egg or how to organise a five-course meal, now's your chance. Call us from three o'clock. Five. You hear the beginning of a program about college canteens. A team of nutritionists has been evaluating the food which is on sale in a number of college canteens, with surprising results. The survey shows that the increased variety of snacks on offer is remarkable, though the situation is still far from ideal. It wasn't long ago that there were constant complaints about the lack of fruit and vegetables and the predominance of high sugar and fatty items from teachers in particular. Probably as a result of that pressure. Colleges became aware of the problem without ever promising quick results. Perhaps not surprisingly, the students themselves say they miss the sweeter snacks. Now play the recording again. A team of nutritionists has been evaluating the food which is on sale in a number of college canteens, with surprising results. The survey shows that the increased variety of snacks on offer is remarkable, though the situation is still far from ideal. It wasn't long ago that there were constant complaints about the lack of fruit and vegetables and the predominance of high sugar and fatty items from teachers in particular. Probably as a result of that pressure, colleges became aware of the problem without ever promising quick results. Perhaps not surprisingly, the students themselves say they miss the sweeter snacks. Six. You hear a young woman talking about her career. I'd recently left school and I was helping my parents in their shop when I heard about this half-day vacancy at the bookshop. The only work I'd ever done was a few hours at the shop and a few little holiday jobs, which were great fun because my friends were doing them too. But whilst I was a bit uneasy about this job because I'm not that good at admin tasks, I could see that this was my chance to focus on those weak points. I'd have made more money if I'd stayed working in the shop, as my parents were keen to point out, but I don't regret my choice. Now play the recording again. I'd recently left school and I was helping my parents in their shop when I heard about this half-day vacancy at the bookshop. The only work I'd ever done was a few hours at the shop and a few little holiday jobs, which were great fun because my friends were doing them too. But whilst I was a bit uneasy about this job because I'm not that good at admin tasks. I could see that this was my chance to focus on those weak points. I'd have made more money if I'd stayed working in the shop, as my parents were keen to point out, but I don't regret my choice. Seven. You hear part of a program about a clothes designer.
A lot's been said about Jack Sommer, the young designer who's set to dominate next year's fashion shows with his bold designs in strong colours, hasn't it, Jane? Yes, Sommer's collections have been both praised to the sky and criticised harshly by the press, and it's not difficult to understand why this should be. He uses everyday materials, but for dresses that would be out of place anywhere except the catwalk. You can't imagine yourself wearing them, no matter how special the occasion. But I believe this is precisely his strength. He's an artist who has created objects of beauty unlike any other. Now play the recording again. A lot's been said about Jack Sommer, the young designer who's set to dominate next year's fashion shows with his bold designs in strong colours, hasn't it, Jane? Yes, Sommer's collections have been both praised to the sky and criticised harshly by the press, and it's not difficult to understand why this should be. He uses everyday materials, but for dresses that would be out of place anywhere except the catwalk. You can't imagine yourself wearing them, no matter how special the occasion. But I believe this is precisely his strength. He's an artist who has created objects of beauty unlike any other. 8. You overhear a discussion about the sport of snow kiting. So, how's it different to other winter sports? Well, take downhill skiing, for instance. You have to book lessons, start on the nursery slopes and all that. But with snow kiting, you just need a wide snow-covered area, like a frozen lake or field, and you're off. Like with all winter sports, beginners should err on the side of caution. They need to be sure they can judge wind speed. Now play the recording again. So how's it different to other winter sports? Well, take downhill skiing, for instance. You have to book lessons, start on the nursery slopes and all that. But with snow kiting, you just need a wide snow-covered area, like a frozen lake or field, and you're off. Like with all winter sports, beginners should err on the side of caution. They need to be sure they can judge wind speed. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You'll hear a radio program about a boy called Michael who crossed the Atlantic in a sailing boat. For questions nine to eighteen, complete the sentences. You now have 45 seconds to look at part two. In 2007, Michael Parham, a 14-year-old boy from the south of England, became the youngest person to sail across the Atlantic alone. Michael set off from Gibraltar on the 5,600-kilometre voyage, which took 47 days. It was a long and, some may say, dangerous adventure, but Michael was determined to get there. Michael started sailing when he was seven and says the idea of an Atlantic crossing had been floating around in his head for a few years. Then one day his father, Peter, who's a keen sailor, decided that the time was right. Michael helped with the design of a new nine-metre yacht, which was built for them and to which Michael gave the name Cheeky Monkey. They say that for a real sailor, crossing the Atlantic isn't a big deal – but people imagine that sharks and huge waves would be the greatest dangers. In fact, Michael's father sailed alongside his son in his own boat to make sure he was OK. 
They worked in shifts throughout the night, an hour on, then an hour off, because one of them had to be on watch in case large ships came too near to them. Are you wondering what Michael ate during his voyage? Well, he says he and his father filled two supermarket trolleys with things like sausages, spaghetti, and stews, which could be easily heated in a pan. Everything had to be in tins, though, because that type of food keeps fresher than stuff in packets or jars. So, what did Michael miss most? He says he sometimes missed human contact and having a face to face conversation. He got used to his limited food supply, but says what he really longed for was hot toast. Knowing what teenagers are like, I'd been expecting him to say burgers or crisps, but then Michael is no ordinary teenager. When asked how he communicated with his father, Michael explains that it was all done by radio, though for Michael, nothing compared with the pleasure of following his father's progress through his binoculars. Michael also communicated with his family at home by satellite phone. One day, his father contacted Michael to tell him a part of his own boat was broken, which really disappointed Michael because it might mean that they would have to go slower. But in the end, that wasn't necessary. I asked Michael how he entertained himself on the boat. He told me he'd taken his guitar with him, but it had stayed in its case throughout the trip. He couldn't play because the boat was always rolling about. He loved to read, and he also had an iPod that his sister had lent him. This he plugged into portable speakers, and it was on pretty much all the time. Was there anything that frightened Michael? He says the weather was a bit of a worry at times, and once he got caught in a Force 9 storm, but managed to handle the boat okay. The one event that really shook him was when a flying fish jumped into the boat and hit him on the shoulder. But mostly things were great, like sailing alongside dolphins and seeing the bluest skies anyone could ever imagine. Everybody is really proud of Michael's achievements. And a remarkable thing about the trip is that he also raised thousands of pounds for the charity known as Children in Need. His school has been very supportive. The head teacher allowed Michael to miss school, saying that a few weeks on the ocean would be an amazing learning experience. It's quite likely that Michael's next challenge will be to sail non stop around the world. His father would do the trip in another boat, but it would be a very different experience because they would be in 20 meter boats which travel much faster, so they would never really be in sight of each other. Michael says next time he'll remember to pack some photos to remember friends and family if he feels lonely, but he'll leave the guitar at home. Now play the recording again. In 2007, Michael Parham, a 14 year old boy from the south of England, became the youngest person to sail across the Atlantic alone. Michael set off from Gibraltar on the 5,600 kilometre voyage, which took 47 days. It was a long and some may say dangerous adventure, but Michael was determined to get there. Michael started sailing when he was seven and says the idea of an Atlantic crossing had been floating around in his head for a few years. Then one day his father, Peter, who's a keen sailor, decided that the time was right. Michael helped with the design of a new nine-metre yacht, which was built for them and to which Michael gave the name Cheeky Monkey. They say that for a real sailor, crossing the Atlantic isn't a big deal, but people imagine that sharks and huge waves would be the greatest dangers. In fact, Michael's father sailed alongside his son in his own boat to make sure he was OK. They worked in shifts throughout the night, an hour on, then an hour off, because one of them had to be on watch in case large ships came too near to them. Are you wondering what Michael ate during his voyage? Well, he says he and his father filled two supermarket trolleys with things like sausages, spaghetti and stews, which could be easily heated in a pan. Everything had to be in tins, though, because that type of food keeps fresher than stuff in packets or jars. So what did Michael miss most? 
He says he sometimes missed human contact and having a face-to-face conversation. He got used to his limited food supply, but says what he really longed for was hot toast. Knowing what teenagers are like, I'd been expecting him to say burgers or crisps, but then Michael is no ordinary teenager. When asked how he communicated with his father, Michael explains that it was all done by radio, though for Michael nothing compared with the pleasure of following his father's progress through his binoculars. Michael also communicated with his family at home by satellite phone. One day, his father contacted Michael to tell him a part of his own boat was broken, which really disappointed Michael because it might mean that they would have to go slower. But in the end, that wasn't necessary. I asked Michael how he entertained himself on the boat. He told me he'd taken his guitar with him, but it had stayed in its case throughout the trip. He couldn't play because the boat was always rolling about. He loved to read, and he also had an iPod that his sister had lent him. This he plugged into portable speakers, and it was on pretty much all the time. Was there anything that frightened Michael? He says the weather was a bit of a worry at times, and once he got caught in a Force Nine storm, but managed to handle the boat okay. The one event that really shook him was when a flying fish jumped into the boat and hit him on the shoulder. But mostly things were great, like sailing alongside dolphins and seeing the bluest skies anyone could ever imagine. Everybody is really proud of Michael's achievements, and a remarkable thing about the trip is that he also raised thousands of pounds for the charity known as Children in Need. His school has been very supportive. The head teacher allowed Michael to miss school, saying that a few weeks on the ocean would be an amazing learning experience. It's quite likely that Michael's next challenge will be to sail non-stop around the world. His father would do the trip in another boat, but it would be a very different experience because they would be in twenty-meter boats, which travel much faster, so they would never really be in sight of each other. Michael says next time he'll remember to pack some photos to remember friends and family if he feels lonely, but he'll leave the guitar at home. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You'll hear five different people talking about cookery courses. For questions nineteen to twenty-three, choose from the list A to F. What each speaker says about the course they took. Use the letters only once. There are three extra letters which you do not need to use. You now have thirty seconds to look at part three. Speaker one. There's such a vast range of cookery schools; it's unbelievable. Before booking a course, it's advisable to decide what you want from it. For me, it was easy. I wanted to pick up some new ideas for entertaining, but didn't need any basic techniques. So the course at the Brandale Cookery School suited me well. There were some people there who didn't know how to boil an egg, but there was extra tuition for them. The course is run by Sylvie Brandale, who's written cookbooks and appeared on TV, and subjects included stress-free parties and sauces from around the world. All great topics, and all of the ingredients were provided. Speaker two. I was very lucky, Davy. I was on holiday, and I happened to hear that there was a new cookery school at the nearby Four Seasons Hotel. They had four-hour classes every Saturday, starting at seven a.m. The day I attended, there was a group of ten enthusiastic participants, all eagerly awaiting instructions. Though I gathered from their conversations that, unlike me, they were all fairly experienced cooks. 
You can imagine the look on our faces, though, when we were told we were going to visit the open-air fish market down by the port. We all came back having selected freshly caught seafood and were then taught the art of preparing it. Great stuff. Speaker 3 I'm a good cook, or so my sister says, so she thought I'd do an advanced course, but I was keen to go through the basics again, and this time I was determined to enjoy it. I registered for Glyn Harvey's cookery classes. Only four people in a class. We watched while he prepared the dishes, making it all seem so effortless. There wasn't much real cooking, although he did invite us to help slice the potatoes and tomatoes, and we were given some tasty, easy-to-cook recipes to take home. I came away bursting with ideas for giving a dinner party, something I hadn't felt like doing in a long time. Speaker 4 the course I attended covered a range of techniques from basic to advanced and it gave you lots of practical tips. I was there to make up for the fact that sadly, as a youngster, I was hardly ever allowed into the kitchen, which meant I'd turned into a chuck-it-in-the-pan sort of cook. Claire, the teacher, was very chatty and full of enthusiasm. She demonstrated several dishes in the morning while we took notes and then we were given some equipment and it was our turn to have a go. I made a splendid vegetable tart, which we ate at lunch. Now I'm planning to go again, and this time I'll concentrate on the more demanding recipes. Speaker 5 This weekend cookery course I did had an emphasis on local ingredients with hands-on practice with the chefs. I wouldn't have been happy with taking notes and following demonstrations, no matter how impressive the food produced. I wanted to get my hands dirty, just as I'd done as a little girl in school cookery lessons. It was at a seaside resort, and you stay in a hotel, which is very close to the fishing port, and so get to cook the local seafood. It's really intensive, and you cook two-course lunches as well as four-course dinners, but you get enough free time to make it an enjoyable weekend, too. Now play the recording again. Speaker 1 There's such a vast range of cookery schools, it's unbelievable. Before booking a course, it's advisable to decide what you want from it. For me, it was easy. I wanted to pick up some new ideas for entertaining, but didn't need any basic techniques, so the course at the Brandale Cookery School suited me well. There were some people there who didn't know how to boil an egg, but there was extra tuition for them. The course is run by Sylvie Brandale, who's written cookbooks and appeared on TV, and subjects included stress-free parties and sources from around the world. All great topics, and all of the ingredients were provided. Speaker 2 I was very lucky, Davy. I was on holiday, and I happened to hear that there was a new cookery school at the nearby Four Seasons Hotel. They had four-hour classes every Saturday, starting at 7 a.m. The day I attended, there was a group of ten enthusiastic participants, all eagerly awaiting instructions, though I gathered from their conversations that, unlike me, they were all fairly experienced cooks. You can imagine the look on our faces, though, when we were told we were going to visit the open-air fish market down by the port. We all came back having selected freshly caught seafood and were then taught the art of preparing it. Great stuff. Speaker 3 I'm a good cook, or so my sister says, so she thought I'd do an advanced course, but I was keen to go through the basics again, and this time I was determined to enjoy it. I registered for Glyn Harvey's cookery classes. Only four people in a class... We watched while he prepared the dishes, making it all seem so effortless. There wasn't much real cooking, although he did invite us to help slice the potatoes and tomatoes, and we were given some tasty, easy-to-cook recipes to take home. I came away bursting with ideas for giving a dinner party, something I hadn't felt like doing in a long time. Speaker 4 
The course I attended covered a range of techniques from basic to advanced, and it gave you lots of practical tips. I was there to make up for the fact that, sadly, as a youngster, I was hardly ever allowed into the kitchen, which meant I'd turned into a chuck it in the pan sort of cook. Claire, the teacher, was very chatty and full of enthusiasm. She demonstrated several dishes in the morning while we took notes, and then we were given some equipment, and it was our turn to have a go. I made a splendid vegetable tart, which we ate at lunch. Now I'm planning to go again, and this time I'll concentrate on the more demanding recipes. Speaker five. This weekend cookery course I did had an emphasis on local ingredients with hands-on practice with the chefs. I wouldn't have been happy with taking notes and following demonstrations, no matter how impressive the food produced. I wanted to get my hands dirty, just as I'd done as a little girl in school cookery lessons. It was at a seaside resort, and you stay in a hotel which is very close to the fishing port, and so get to cook the local seafood. It's really intensive, and you cook two course lunches as well as four course dinners, but you get enough free time to make it an enjoyable weekend too. That is the end of part three. Now turn to part four. You'll hear an interview with Pamela Green, a young fashion designer. For questions twenty-four to thirty, choose the best answer: A, B, or C. You now have one minute to look at part four. Hello, Pamela. Welcome to the program. So many young people want to be fashion designers these days, but don't know how to get started. Hi. I felt exactly like that myself. You must first discover if this is really what you want to do. I wasn't sure to begin with, so I started off by looking for a store in my neighbourhood that sold its own clothes. The owner invited me into her studio and told me what a typical day was like. She allowed me to ask as many questions as I wanted. Having made up my mind, I then contacted a few colleges to see what courses in fashion were on offer, and I was lucky to find one that seemed ideal. So, a degree in fashion is a must. Well, you often meet designers who go to college later in life after years of working in the industry. The truth is, the best students aren't always the best designers. But there's no denying that a degree will show that you've got certain basic skills and get you your first job. Don't be surprised to find colleagues with fewer qualifications on higher pay than yourself, though. Making progress from that point will depend entirely on your personal talent.、Ah. What basic skills do you need? When you ask a fashion student what they want to do, they often reply, "Have my own line." Not an easy task, I must say. You need work experience first, ideally in a successful fashion shop, to understand that this industry is led by commerce. Starting your own line requires capital and a clear overview of how it's going to develop. Without it, clothes design can only be a hobby. Of course, if you've got an eye for colour, style, and shape, and an ability to draw, you shouldn't let go of the dream. Where do you get the inspiration for your designs? To be a good designer. You have to be aware of the world you live in. You need to go out and look at people's lives and attitudes. You really have to learn how to observe what's happening around you, and I don't mean going abroad necessarily. 
My social circle is invaluable for me, for example, a constant source of ideas. You have to remember the clothes are not for you. You have to adapt to what other people want. And don't be tempted to imitate the famous designers, however beautiful their collections might look. Now you're a successful designer, are things easier? Uh, it took me a while to learn to cope with criticism, though. You think your design drawings look brilliant, but you mustn't get upset if the garment doesn't look as you'd imagined it. What I've never managed to get used to is the sheer amount of work involved in finishing your collection well in advance of the season. Some designers stop attending fashion shows, for example, which involve lots of time consuming travelling, but I'd be unhappy to give that up. Do you have to do a lot of reading to keep up with trends? You have to read fashion magazines and other media that reflect current trends and tastes. It doesn't matter whether you want to use them in your own designs. Nobody knows what styles will be fashionable in, say, two years' time. But the point is, you have to know just about everything that's been done before so that you can spot it when it becomes popular again. <laughs> This is a very competitive industry. Realistically, what are the chances for somebody starting? Uh, don't make the mistake of aiming just for designing outfits, which is just one part of a vast industry. You may be perfectly happy as an obscure but competent designer of small pieces for collections jewelry, hats, shoes, all of which need to be created. And then somebody has to market them, sell them, write about them. Fame and glory is just for the top 20 world designers. And life isn't always wonderful, even for them. <laughs> Pamela, many thanks. Now play the recording again. Hello, Pamela. Welcome to the programme. So many young people want to be fashion designers these days, but don't know how to get started. Hi. I felt exactly like that myself. You must first discover if this is really what you want to do. I wasn't sure to begin with, so I started off by looking for a store in my neighbourhood that sold its own clothes. The owner invited me into her studio and told me what a typical day was like. She allowed me to ask as many questions as I wanted. Having made up my mind, I then contacted a few colleges to see what courses in fashion were on offer, and I was lucky to find one that seemed ideal. So, a degree in fashion is a must? Well, you often meet designers who go to college later in life, after years of working in the industry. The truth is, the best students aren't always the best designers. But there's no denying that a degree will show that you've got certain basic skills and get you your first job. Don't be surprised to find colleagues with fewer qualifications on higher pay than yourself, though. Making progress from that point will depend entirely on your personal talent.、Ah. What basic skills do you need? When you ask a fashion student what they want to do, they often reply, Have my own line. Not an easy task, I must say. You need work experience first, ideally in a successful fashion shop, to understand that this industry is led by commerce. Starting your own line requires capital and a clear overview of how it's going to develop. Without it, clothes design can only be a hobby. Of course, if you've got an eye for colour, style, and shape, and an ability to draw, you shouldn't let go of the dream. Where do you get the inspiration for your designs? To be a good designer, You have to be aware of the world you live in. You need to go out and look at people's lives and attitudes. You really have to learn how to observe what's happening around you. And I don't mean going abroad necessarily. My social circle is invaluable for me, for example, a constant source of ideas. You have to remember the clothes are not for you. You have to adapt to what other people want. And don't be tempted to imitate the famous designers, however beautiful their collections might look. Now you're a successful designer, are things easier?、Uh, it took me a while to learn to cope with criticism, though. You think your design drawings look brilliant, but you mustn't get upset if the garment doesn't look as you'd imagined it. What I've never managed to get used to is the sheer amount of work involved in finishing your collection well in advance of the season. Some designers stop attending fashion shows, for example, which involve lots of time consuming travelling, but I'd be unhappy to give that up. Do you have to do a lot of reading to keep up with trends? 
you have to read fashion magazines and other media that reflect current trends and tastes. It doesn't matter whether you want to use them in your own designs. Nobody knows what styles will be fashionable in, say, two years' time. But the point is, you have to know just about everything that's been done before so that you can spot it when it becomes popular again. <laughs> This is a very competitive industry. Realistically, what are the chances for somebody starting? Uh, don't make the mistake of aiming just for designing outfits, which is just one part of a vast industry. You may be perfectly happy as an obscure but competent designer of small pieces for collections, jewellery, hats, shoes, all of which need to be created. And then somebody has to market them, sell them, write about them. Fame and glory is just for the top 20 world designers. And life isn't always wonderful, even for them. <laughs> Pamela, many thanks.